Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsoring partner, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. I want you to take a quick second and imagine what our nation would look like if we boldly invested in our neighborhoods and cities and showed young people, particularly black men and boys, real opportunities to build upon their God-given assets and live their best lives possible. That's the work that the Campaign for Black Male Achievement and my dear friend Sean Dove, CEO of CBME, has been working on over the past decade. They've joined and supported thousands of leaders on the ground to elevate and accelerate this very vision and mission. Visit tbpod.com slash partners today to learn more about CBMA and consider joining their membership and or donating to help them scale the impact of this growing field of black male achievement. You're listening to the trailblazers.fm podcast, where we'll explore the stories of today's successful Black professionals, entrepreneurs, and leaders. Join us to access the knowledge, resources, and tools of these accomplished professionals and come away with the know-how, confidence, and motivation you'll need to blaze your trail. And now, here's your host, Stephen A. Hart. Hello and welcome to an all new episode of the Trailblazers.fm podcast. Our guest today is none other than Mr. Marvin Wilmoth. He's an amazing, intelligent, and an ambitious young man who happens to be the commissioner of North Bay Village's Harbor Island District down in South Florida. He's also a managing principal and co founder of Generation Development Group, a boutique real estate development and consulting firm. And beyond his professional aspirations, Marvin's an avid traveler and an absolute lover of music. And I first met Marvin through his wife, Jody, who's a dear friend, a BFF of mine for more than 15 years now. And, you know, truly just have all the respect and love for this brother. Before we dive into today's episode with Marvin, I wanted to give a shout out and a big ups to T. Patillo who left us a five-star rating and a review over on Apple Podcasts. I just want to share what it read. I'm very impressed with your content, your approach, and genuine interview style. Inspiring, motivational, and insightful. You've established some great interviews that you can continue to expand on and dive deeper. I'm a trailblazer.fm fan now. Keep doing what you're doing. Listen up. Thank you so much, T. Patillo for those kind words. I really appreciate it. Listen up, Blazer Nation. The main way that we grow this platform is through you. So sharing the episode up with your family, friends, and colleagues helps us a ton. And we also believe that it helps when, you know, Apple Podcasts algorithms see your ratings and your reviews. So if you've not yet had a chance to do so, I'm going to ask that you hop on over right now to Apple Podcasts, right? You can hop into the app, search for trailblazers.fm like you're doing it for the very first time. And when you click on trailblazers.fm and scroll down, you'll see the reviews and the link there to submit a review of your own. I really appreciate it. and just want to say thank you in advance for helping us out with that. That's it. Let's get set to dive in and receive today's motivational mission fuel from our featured guest, Mr. Marvin Wilmoth. Marvin, welcome, my brethren. Thank you so much thank for being here thank today. You. I appreciate you spending the time. So I had the pleasure of meeting Marvin, what, several years ago now. And he is the husband to a lifelong friend of mine and got married almost a year ago. Almost a year ago, yeah. Almost yeah. a year ago. Time um, flies when you're having fun, so they say. Absolutely. And I could not think of two people more suited for each other. No one of my favorite couples and favorite people. So I'm just so blessed to have you here. I wanted to start off where we do most of our conversations, which is from a place of gratitude. So as you kind of reflect on what's happening in life right now, what's an unexpected blessing that you're grateful for? I actually, it's funny, it's very serendipitous that we're having this conversation right now, but I just recently was selected for a Marshall Memorial Fellowship, which was part of the German Marshall Fund. The German Marshall Fund was founded after World War II to promote transatlantic relationships between the United States and Europe. And every year they choose about 75 
young leaders between the United States and Europe to essentially do a role swap and spend time in each other's respective countries. So I had an opportunity to spend 24 days in Europe in a number of different locations, Bucharest, Romania, Berlin, Germany, Brussels, Belgium, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and Turin, Italy. And you know, the conversation centered around how do we promote transatlantic relationships, some of the scary sort of trajectory and trends around the rise in liberal democracy and in populism, not just here in the United States, but throughout Europe, and then also finding solutions to local issues, whether it's affordable housing or sea level rise and climate change. And that was a once in a lifetime experience. And, you know, I think as you go through your career, it's very easy to get caught up in the minutia in the day to day of your everyday operations. But to have an opportunity to take a step out of that day to day role and look at what's happening on a global scale at a Mm -hmm. 50,000 foot level really helped me sort of reprioritize not just personally, but professionally, where should I be spending my time as we're thinking through how do we promote positive dialogue around democracy and things of that nature? And then just having the ability to network with some of the brightest minds, not just here in the United States, but also in Europe, I think was something that is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I'm incredibly grateful for that exposure that I recently had. That sounds amazing, man. That's pretty awesome. Let me ask you, I know that you're Honduran American. Where did you grow up? Yeah, it's a pretty long story. You know, my family is Afro-Latino. My mom is from La Ceiba. My dad's from Rotan. But I grew up, I was actually born on the naval base in Jacksonville, Florida. My dad was enlisted in the Navy at the time. And so I spent the first 10 years of my life in Jacksonville. And then at some point in time, we moved to Fort Lauderdale when I was starting middle school. And Fort Lauderdale, as I don't have to tell you, is a very, very different place from Jacksonville. Um, (laughs) Yes. It's it's the equivalent of going from the Deep South to more of a Caribbean type culture. You know, I think that that experience definitely gave me a perspective, not just on rural places that people grow up, but also in cities and states. But, you know, I grew up in a very Caribbean culture, although my family is from Honduras, you know, my father is from the British islands, which I would consider to be more Caribbean, so more Jamaican or Bahamian than I would Central American. My mother is a city woman, and so, or city girl, so that's definitely more when you think of Central America, you know, where she came from. But the Afro Latino, or Latino, as I say to my friends, mix definitely gave me a very interesting perspective on life growing up here in the United States. It's funny you said that because I'm still trying to figure you out, man. I mean, I don't know anybody that, you know, knows so much about Caribbean culture and music, especially like you're so exposed to <laughs> to all kinds of music and then also so well traveled. I know you're talking about yeah. the places that GMF took you. Is there a continent you have not yet visited? Antarctica. Not yet <laughs> <checked off. laughs> In Australia, we got really close. Jody and I, this past summer, or I guess in the fall, we went on our wedding to East Asia. So Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, but haven't quite made it to Australia, but that's definitely high up on the list. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So is it what, a couple years ago? No, probably that you kind of looked at the political space and thought that you would have something to bring to the table. Before I get into that, Can you share your background, maybe, so we have some perspective here. Share what you're doing prior to stepping into this political space. To be 100% honest, I wasn't necessarily planning for a long period of time to run for office. I mean, Mm. I think that there were a number of things that were the stars aligned, and I consistently had to ask ask myself the question, if not you, then who? And oftentimes, the answer was, well... You're the only one that seems to be ready to step into this particular role. But prior to running for office, and I'm currently vice mayor of a city called North Bay Village in Miami, Florida, about 10,000 residents or so. And before running for office, I was, you know, I had been invited by one of the local commissioners to get more involved, given my background in finance and real estate. And so I started by initially serving on local boards and I was on the planning and zoning board for a number of years both as a board member and then as vice chair. 
And then over time, opportunities opened up where some of the current leadership were termed out of their positions and it was not clear who was ready and willing to step up to tackle some of the challenges that we had here from a leadership perspective and on sea level rise and climate change, given that we're here in coastal Miami. And so it's then that I started having the conversation. But if you ask friends, they feel as if they've known this for quite some time and I've been denying it myself for a little bit. I'll actually give you a little bit of a story, a little known fun fact. So in college, I went to Florida A&M for undergrad and was very involved in student government there in both like class president and a number of different roles and actually ended up running for student government president against none other than Andrew Gillum. Really? Uh, and so, yeah. And so we, uh, we I actually, didn't know that. <laughs> we went, yeah, you know, look, you learn something new every day. And so we ran against each other. It was a pretty crowded field at first, ended up going down to a runoff and I lost by like right around a hundred votes or so, my partner and I. But what a wonderful experience that was to be able to compete with someone who, even at that point in time, I could have told you was going to be a star from a political perspective. I mean, the determination and focus that Andrew has is just unbelievable. So that was my first foray into politics, if you will. And it was great to, as I was on the campaign trail here, to also be able to grace the stage with Andrew and do a number of different things and get encouragement from him on things I should be considering as I'm running for office. But, you know, I would say that was probably the beginning, but a little bit different playing out than what I had initially thought. But what a wonderful experience. That must have been. That's amazing. I did not know that. So that's pretty neat. So we'll talk a bit about your, because you touched on this just briefly, but your background, you have a lot of exposure in finance and real estate, right? Sure. And you've now started, you've taken that experience and you're presently, you founded and you're building a business, I believe, Generation Development Group. Talk to me about, you know, what's driving you in the work that you're doing with Generation and kind of where you see this going. Fantastic. Yeah, it's a longer story, but I'll give you the cliff note. So I started my career on Wall Street in investment banking. And one of the things I was doing while I was there was raising capital for growth companies. And so biotech companies, real estate companies, and a number of different industries. But one of the consistent themes of the folks that I met with when we were raising capital of a lot of high net worth individuals was, one, you're too, intel- you're too smart to be working for JP Morgan, which I thought was an unbelievable statement given that the smartest people I'd ever worked with at the time were there at JP Morgan. I mean, you had every sort of different ethnicity and group represented. You had all the most elite colleges and universities represented. So uh, that statement in and of itself was fuddling to me. But fast forward to the second point is that if you want to be and build and generate wealth, you're going to have to either create something or own something. Mm -hmm. And so I used that information to make a determination on what it was that I wanted to do moving forward. And I was good at the deal process. So I loved negotiation. I loved building relationships and form relationships that would create business opportunities, not just for myself, but for everyone involved. And I ended up going back to grad school for real estate development once I realized that real estate was the best place for me to utilize both the finance and the relationship building skill set for me specifically. And so I started in the industry in real estate probably in 2009 even a little bit earlier than that. And one of the things I noticed as I was going through it, I at the time was working for one of the largest affordable housing developers in the nation and was able to pioneer a new type of development that really focused on partnering with nonprofit organizations to help them expand their programming. So uh, very specifically, there's a development called The Beacon that I worked on in Miami where we partnered with a nonprofit, provided them with free space for the year to expand their programming, built out their offices and two classrooms for after school education. They have a female mentorship program, STEAM program, so science, technology, engineering, art, and math, and are just doing great and wonderful things. So it helped us accomplish two things. One, we activated a space that otherwise would not necessarily be activated. And two, we allowed a nonprofit that was doing good work in Overtown, which is a predominantly African-American community, to stay there and not just stay, but also to flourish and thrive. And from that experience, I realized, one, I think the metrics of what 
successful, and I'm using air quotes here, development looks like are off. I mean, I think right now when we talk about what does a successful real estate development or transaction look like, Mm -hmm. it's purely financial metrics that we use, return on investment, return on income, equity return, et cetera. But no one is thinking about the humanistic elements of community. And when we think about your community, when I think about my community, the things in which we use to determine or to classify success have nothing to do with financial returns. Yes, it would be nice if the home that I live in appreciates in value or the condo or the area that I live in you know, sort of has a higher net worth connotation. But the reality of the situation is I really care about access to amenities. How close am I to schools? How close am I to healthcare? If I need to get additional skills training, is there a place for me to go and do that? And so we created a new, essentially we're creating a new model here that focuses on utilizing the social determinants of health as the drivers for the built environment. So really focusing on health and wellness, on environmental sustainability, in uh, lifelong learning and education, in workforce development and training and community engagement, and using those to really create value in a community. So instead of having to drive across town to go to a hospital or finding time to get additional workforce training, why not bring all of those wraparound and ancillary services to the community itself and then use the community as a sort of focal point for economic and educational development in the entire region. And so by doing that, I think that message has resonated not just with local stakeholders, be it political officials or investment in, or investment groups, but also the communities that we're working to serve. and. Essentially, what we do right out of the gate is go and ask the very specific question. You live here in this neighborhood. What are the types of things that you, as a resident, as a taxpayer, could use to help improve your quality of life? Mm -hmm. And then we build around that. It sounds like a very simple and common sense answer, but a lot of times it's really purely monetarily driven. And so we're really excited about being able to prove out this concept on a national scale and are working to do just that right now. So that's kind of where I was hoping to get some insight. So have you been able to build this in a smaller setting that then can be done on a national scale? Is there like a test area, if you will? Yeah, absolutely. So we're working right now in Buffalo, New York to prove out the concept with a development that is going to be mixed use, mixed income, and transit oriented. And so it'll have a portion of the units will be affordable and affordable. We typically like to qualify that as folks making 60% of the median income and below. So depending on where you are, that number can vary wildly. If you live in a high income area like DC, where the median income is over $110,000, if you're making sixty or sixty-five thousand dollars, you qualify to live in affordable housing there. Which is every first-year professional, if your nurses, your teachers, your firefighters, your police officers, your essential employees. We really, really try to focus on that. And then we have a workforce component that folks that make a little bit too much to qualify for affordable housing, but are not quite ready to pay the luxury rent and need that extra income in order to pay for schooling or healthcare or any of the number of things. And then part of the development ends up being purely market driven, which is, you know, anyone who can pay two dollars a square foot for a unit. So think of all your typical DC rents or New York rents there. And then the mix of uses would be residential, commercial, retail, and then those community uses that we spoke about very briefly. But what we're gonna do is we're working right now formulating and creating programmatic and community partnerships to really think through an artistic and creative village. So we're working right now on having co-working spaces in addition to artist-focused live work loss as part of a larger, call it 500 or so unit development. And we'll utilize a number of different financing sources, a number of different structures in order to create a mixed income neighborhood that anyone who lives in Buffalo, any resident of Buffalo can live in. Mm -hmm. And By doing so, we avoid a couple of things. One, just as a general policy matter, we don't believe in the concentration of poverty in any one specific area. And so the mixed income approach allows a number of different groups to live in an area and benefit from all the amenities associated with it. Uh, And then two, we believe that 
by utilizing this, we can very quantifiably improve people's quality of life Mm -hmm. and are working right now on figuring out what the specific metrics should be that we can use to then say, hey, look, we have improved this community and we've done it in such a way by the number of kids that go through an after school program specifically in this neighborhood, or have we seen improvements in grades or test scores or things of that nature? So we're thinking through what the performance metrics should be, but yeah, I was kind of wondering really about fun. that, right? Like I was wondering like yeah. how much time do you probably need to be able to measure? I mean, obviously it's dynamic and you'll always be able to pull apart information as time goes on, but how long, how much time is needed before you're able to move on from say Buffalo and begin doing that work in other cities? I don't think it'll be long at all. And the metrics in each neighborhood will change, right? Right. So in the east side of Buffalo, where we're doing work right now, some of the issues are high school graduation rates, right? So that's where we'll be focusing a lot of our attention. Who do we partner with that can provide those services and will do a lot of the metric tracking for us? That way, you know, our skill set is in real estate and finance, not in sort of policy implementation and very specifically data gathering. However, we do have partners and are working on creating partnerships that that is what they do. So mm-hmm. groups like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, groups that are tracking affordable housing and other sort of workforce training outcomes, whether it's financial or number of people trained. And so we're going to utilize those partnerships, those neighborhood partnerships as the initial tool to quantify what that impact looks like. I think when you think about the arc of time, you aren't going to be able to see real quality of life outcomes until you know five or 10 years later. But I think by thinking through strategically where you're trying to go, you have a higher likelihood of achieving that success. Whereas right now, I think a lot of developers will build housing and say, look, you know, we built this great community. Here's a place that you can live that is affordable to whatever your socioeconomic situation may be. You know, good luck on figuring out the rest of it. The problem is a lot of times access, not interest, right? Everyone would like to have access to additional healthcare options, but a lot of times it's complicated and the information can't be broken down or isn't broken down in a way that is digestible to the general public. We plan on partnering with someone who can do the breaking down and can do the education for us, and we will help them facilitate those actions by either providing inexpensive space or providing a place to convene in order to do that and providing like community spaces where people can get together and just learn and ask questions. Marv, without question, everyone listening can pretty much gather at this point that one, you're very smart, and two, you have to be incredibly well connected to be able to put this kind of an idea into action. And as I listen to what you're sharing from the idea through to how you're building this out in Buffalo, I'm amazed. But let me ask you, because we love to talk about the flip side of the wheel with the valleys, right? As you're building out generation, talk to us about maybe some of the challenges or failures and the lessons that came by way of you taking action and stepping into some of this. (laughs) <laughs> how much long do we have an hour that's not, a, that's, that's not enough time to talk about all the times i failed but i'll give you sure I, this is a common question that everyone always asks it's a question that i used to always ask entrepreneurs you know how did you get to the point where you now have a company that's valued at x or you raised x amount of dollars and mm-hmm. you know my specific path was a little longer than i think most others would be if you don't have a lot of us you know people of color don't have access to the type of capital resources that some others may have. And so without that access to capital, it's incredibly difficult to get involved in the real estate industry. You have to have money to not just build and grow the business, but also to provide guarantees for the work that you're doing. You know, Doing $100 million with the development, you have to have a significant eight-figure number in a bank account somewhere to be able to do that. That does not come easily. And Generation, as you or as we're talking about it now, is actually the third iteration of generation development. Right out of the first real estate company that uh, I told you I worked with, my business partner and I stepped out and tried to form, and he's Italian American, Italian and Ukrainian. But one of the first time we stepped out of the company, we tried to start a company and were met with a lot of resistance. People were slow playing us. I think they saw value in the idea, but didn't feel as if the concept was proven out enough. And so we had to lick our wounds and go and work for another developer and had a lot of success there over a two-year period. And 
tried to revisit it again and were again sort of refuted. Mm-hmm. Like the thought was, okay, anyone can get lucky. Anyone can get lucky once. A broken clock is right twice a day. So do it again and maybe we can have the conversation, mm. which is incredibly frustrating, especially yeah. after you've, you know, you've now proven success, in my opinion, I've proven success twice and had done you know, a number of things to check the boxes, right? I went to the schools that I thought that I was going to have to go to in order to get that social capital that no one talks about, but is incredibly important when having fundraising conversations. You know, I had the experience both on Wall Street and now with a developer. And so having to take a look in the mirror and say, okay, you're not yet ready. When I 100% thought that I was, it was humbling, but it also allowed me to take a step back and to re sort of turn the Rubik's Cube a little bit more and determine, okay, where ideally do you want to end up and what specifically is the strategy to get there? And so if you ever come into my house, it's full of whiteboards and I always have a whiteboard where I'm writing down, you know, what are the big ideas I'm focusing on? What's the strategy to get this deal done? What's the policy that I'm going to work on today for sea level rise and climate change? But this whiteboard and thinking through strategy on a daily basis, we ended up at another company and this time in a different role. So now Generation Development was a joint venture partner as opposed to just being employees. So we've taken now a small step, but a step that is starting to establish us as a company. And I think that was a huge differentiator as we went to the next step, which was to raise capital on our own. We now had a company that had experience that could point specifically to being part of an ownership structure. And I think that definitely changed the conversation when we went to raise capital the third time. And you know, you talk a little bit about relationships. You know, the relationship that ended up making the introduction for us to that capital mm. was someone I had met ten years previous. I was just had... going to ask you about that, Sineva, because I'm interested <laughs> in hearing about this. That I literally was like, you know, who's providing some sort of objective feedback, right, to help you guys grow through these experiences and be able to pivot in the right direction, right? And yep. help, you know, provide some sponsorship maybe to speak on your behalf as you're sure. navigating that journey. Yeah, there are a couple of folks, right? So there aren't many, again, there aren't many people of color who are running their own development shops. So there's a, a young lady out of North Carolina that I had been talking to for some time who early in my real estate career had gone through the same process and had been successful in raising capital and starting her own company. Her name is Dion Nelson with Laurel Street Development in North Carolina. And having a conversation with her, watching her go through that process when I thought she was the most qualified with the most experienced and had deals in hand and was still having difficulty raising that capital. I realized that one, I know it can be done because I've seen it now get done on a large scale. And you know, two, she always said, you know, you have to be incredibly persistent between her and some of the financial relationships that we had closing deals with other groups. A gentleman named Charles Anderson at Korea was very instrumental in sort of leading us and providing that very, very fact-based feedback, right? It's difficult for you to hear from someone you value and trust and respect that maybe it's not time yet for you to, to move forward. And I'm saying that not because I don't believe that you can do it, but because I understand the investment environment and what it is that folks are looking for in order to check this box. And so, you know, sometimes you hear that information, you're like, oh, well, you are you not supportive of me trying to achieve this goal? The answer was, I'm ultimately supportive. I absolutely want to see you be successful. I'm just trying to let you know what the current environment is for what it is you're trying to achieve and what you need to think about if you're ultimately trying to be successful. And so having really, really good relationships and partners that, one, you've consistently provided solid, good work over a period of time, whether it was yours or not. You have to consistently prove that you are willing and able to provide the best quality product, whatever it is, at all times. Having that consistent track record and then knowing the folks that can make introductions for you to groups and can essentially vouch for you when it comes time to raise capital is instrumental in moving any any type of deal forward. I mean, people don't invest in businesses, they invest in people. So if they don't believe in you as a leader, don't believe in you as having the ability to execute, you will never raise money. I love that, man. Some really good gems right there about, you know, processes to follow for young entrepreneurs. Because I'm thinking, you know, 
there's so much wisdom that you're sharing right now that obviously has come from the experiences, right? That you've mm-hmm. had over the years, but anything else that you'd want to share maybe with, you know, a version of yourself, a younger version of yourself that's graduating fam, fam you right now, who's wanting to get into <laughs> real estate development, what's your wisdom to them on what they should be focused on most right now? I guess two things. One, determine what makes you happy and find a way to make money doing that. You know, I was, <laughs> I was in investment banking. I was an average analyst, probably slightly better than average, but I wasn't the best at it. What I was really, really good at though was the relationship side of the business and closing deals. And so understanding that, I had to take my skill set and say, okay, what is it that you can do these two things and be happy and still sort of achieve the goals of helping other people at the same time? And that's how I ended up in real estate, specifically affordable housing. The second thing I would say to myself, probably the most important is every morning when I wake up after I pray for all the great things that I have in my life, including my wife, I take an hour every morning to strategize about what it is I want to accomplish that day and recheck the things that I wanted to accomplish the day before and how far off I'm from that. And so people always laugh at me because I have a full layout of my entire year of goals that I want to achieve. And I worked with a good friend of mine, Leanne Buchanan, to put together a monthly and annual goal list. So Mm -hmm. I'll walk through very specifically, what is it that I want to achieve by the end of this year? And put together a strategy to achieve each of those goals and what I need to do on each a quarterly, yeah. on a monthly basis in order to get there. Love so you know, a lot of times we say, oh, beginning of the year, I'm going to learn a new language. I'll lose 15 pounds. And that's really it. You start working out and then come middle of February, next thing you know, it's no longer a priority. Uh-huh. You know, you know, you've, it's sort of dropped off. And because you didn't have any real plan or implementation plan to get there, that's what ends up happening. But every morning when I take my time to strategize, I can clear my head, think through where it is I want to be and make sure that I'm working towards those. And that helps you eliminate a lot of the things that aren't uh, helpful to achieving your goals. Just focus specifically on what it is you're trying to accomplish and get rid of the rest. That's been incredibly helpful here over the last, I'd say, year as you try to increase the impact that you're having in your local community and globally. I think that It's very easy to get lost in the minutia of the day-to-day and then wake up several months later and realize that you haven't made a much larger impact. But if you're always looking at strategy, if you're always looking at your high-level goals, it helps you not get distracted by other things that could potentially be interesting and exciting, but are not on the path to you achieving what it is that you ultimately want to achieve and want to be happy about. Marvin, I couldn't agree with you more, man. I mean, you know, on the one side, we make plans and God laughs, right? And things happen, yeah. <laughs> change, right? But in the same breath, like you, you know, I've shared this before, but, you know, in 2016, I decided to create that 50,000 foot view of what, you know, I wanted my life to look like. And then yeah. took steps back and said, all right, this is what I want to accomplish in the next 10 years. And as you touched on, you know, began to reverse engineer what needed to happen, what goals need to be set for this year, what tasks need to be set up for this month. And yes, you know, things happen and you're not going to hit all these timelines, but, you know, it makes life so much more fun right now because I have a plan that Mm -hmm. I'm pursuing, right? And if you don't have a plan for your life, believe me, somebody else will, right? You live your life working towards somebody else's goals. But, you know, when you plan that out, when you have clarity, and clarity is so amazing, you know, when you're clear on what your life is going to look like and the legacy you're going to leave. I can't stress this enough, man, you know, and I love that you hit the nail on the head with that because noise consumes you the moment you open your eyes in the morning, right? The noise of life is going to come at you. And if you don't have clarity and you don't have set goals and set tasks, everybody else's noise is going to take over. And before you know it, you know, we're what? Into May right now. I mean, yep. it felt like yesterday that we were together. That was November, right? In November, exactly. <laughs> and just like that, six months later, right? And if you weren't working towards something and before you look up, you know, we're back at December again, right? So 
Uh, exactly. It's so very important to be clear on what your goals are and what you're working towards. Yeah, I'd say there's probably one more thing I'd tell young Marvin. I've been pretty consistent about, but reading books has been the one thing that I think has allowed me to continue to learn and being curious all the time. So a lot of information is hidden in books. You know, you think that things are, are brand new and novel, but history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes, as mm-hmm. I believe someone once said. And so a lot of the situations or problems that we're seeing now are not new. America First did not start with Donald Trump, nor did Drain the Swamp. And I highly encourage everyone to do some research on that. There are a number of books. Madeleine Albright wrote a book about fascism that does a really good job of sort of laying out the history of a lot of different things in these populist movements. I read a book about called High Performance Habits that I highly recommend for folks. It talks about that strategic sort of thinking through how you achieve goals. And it really talks about high performers can also experience sort of lags in their drive and motivation to achieve goals because, again, you get caught in the minutia. But really reading books, continuing to educate yourself, continuing to expose yourself to things that are outside of your skill set. The only reason I ended up on Wall Street is I was in a YMCA program. And my mentor at the time was a guy who worked in business. I think he was just, you know, he was just doing this on the side because he wanted to be able to talk to young adults and help us through high school. And he mentioned, hey, you know, you're in an engineering program. You're good at math. A lot of these guys on Wall Street do this and they, they're really shaping and changing the financial world might be something you want to consider. I don't have to tell you, you know, in Caribbean families, you're either a, lo- a lawyer, <laughs> a, <man> doctor. <laughs> a doctor, or, you know, yeah. or an engineer, and that's all right. you got. Like, you don't really, you don't get yep. exposed to any like sub industries. But just that one conversation had a massive impact on my life. Before that, I was going to be a nuclear engineer, and you know, now look where we are, right? Mm-hmm. So, you got to continue to educate yourself. Got to continue to improve. Got to read books, and. Continue to do the things that make you happy and the rest will work itself out. Let me ask you, you're so busy and you do so much and yet you still find time for good balance with life and traveling and doing the things, keeping that young wife happy. Are (laughs) are you somebody, because I'm going to ask this question more so for me, I'm sure many people listening will likely agree. I find it hard, harder today to pick up a physical book. There are several books on my desk right now. I'm I'm not getting through as much as I would like, Mm. but... I don't know. Are you a hardcover? Do you like the feel of the pages and being able to write in your pages? Or are you new media and you listen to audiobooks? Like how and when do you consume that kind of content? Yeah, I have to do a mixture of both. I think ideally I'd like to have a hard book in my hand because I like to make notes, especially if I'm reading uh, historical nonfiction, which is sort of my bread and butter. I like to have the pages so I can read it right when I read the book right. and when I come back to it. At some point in the future, I can see what my thought process was at that point in the time and if my perspective has changed. And I like to do that with a number of books. (laughs) When we were still courting, and I know you're a young guy, so courting actually means dating. When you get to be my age, I'll I'll let you know a little bit more about that. But when I was courting Jody, I had her read the five love languages, but I gave her my copy of the book. And... (laughs) Needless to say, she was laughing because of some of the comments I wrote Uh in the corner and some of the things that I had underlined. But it goes back to, you know, it also gave her a little bit more perspective and context as to sort of my thoughts around very specifically what she was reading. And I think it was very helpful. So preferably, I'd like to have the hard copy, but there are some books that are perfect for audiobooks. So if you're not trying to remember a bunch of specific details in it, like they may be giving more history, but doesn't have as much detail. I think those are great. So like Bad Blood, The Theranos Story was a great book for audiobook. I think I listened to that in less than 12 hours because it's fantastic. So I I do a mixture of both. When I'm traveling, I try to grab audiobooks that I can listen to while I'm walking or do other things. But ideally, I'd like to have the book in my hand. Listen, Marvin, I could keep... I'm so happy. So at the time of this recording, I'm recording a batch of episodes and this is my fifth hour of recording. And I could just <laughs> go in with you, brother. It was a fun conversation. Learned so much from you today. As we get set to wrap up, first thing, tell us how we can stay connected to you. Sure. I am on Facebook. It's Marvin for NBV on Facebook. And then it's Wilmoth Marvin on Instagram. Those are my two campaign accounts. You can see more and more about that. And we'll be launching 
hopefully our website for the business here, Generation Development Group. It's going to be www.generationdg.com. So look out for that. Be able to look out for that in the next six months or so. Anyone that has web development experience, we're looking for a good person. <laughs> so feel free to reach out. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. I have some ideas on that. Our last question for you for today, what's one action our Blazing Nation should take that's going to help them to blaze their trail? Wow, what's one action? Reach out to somebody doing what it is you want to do and stick close to them like glue. Yes, so an advice. My brother, thank you so much, man. This has been a great conversation. Looking forward to hearing more about Generation and what you have happening next. Fantastic. No, thank you for inviting me. And I look forward to listening to the rest of your podcast here. If there's ever any way I can help you or anyone else or your listeners, please let me know. Happy to do so. I'm Steve Nehart, and you've been listening to the Trailblazers.fm podcast. If you're not yet doing so, consider following Trailblazers.fm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and feel free to connect with me over on LinkedIn. Whenever you're posting stories or social media posts about Trailblazers.fm, be sure to use the hashtag TBPod and hashtag MissionFuel. We'll be able to see you and I'll be able to show some love. And in case you're not aware, our show notes for all our episodes can be found on our website over at TBPod.com. Now, if today was your first time listening, I just want to say big ups, enough respect for checking us out. You've made this Jamaican guy really happy that you're here with us today. And I'd love your help with keeping this black excellence flowing each and every week. So if you haven't yet subscribed, hop on over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Search trailblazers.fm and subscribe, rate, and review us there. Be sure to browse through some of our past episodes. There are more than 150 published episodes now. And a little something is out there for everyone to help keep the knowledge flowing. We grow when you, as part of our Blazer Nation community, shares and invites your friends and family to listen to an episode you think might impact them most. We believe that someone listening to these inspiring stories are going to be moved to make significant changes that have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. Don't miss next week's episode. New episodes are released each and every Monday morning at 5 a.m. Eastern. Blazer Nation, go out today and find a way to rise above, go way beyond, and keep blazing your trail. Your trail.